Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee 16th meeting of 2019. Before we move on to our first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones or put them on silent as they may affect the broadcasting system. So the first item on the agenda is to hear from the Right Honourable Michael Gove MP, who is the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs on the environmental implications for exiting the EU. Mr Gove joins us via video link from London. Good morning, Mr Gove. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm going to go, go straight into questions around common frameworks um, in the event of our, our exiting the EU. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Professor Reid from Dundee University to go over some of the issues that may affect common frameworks. And he asked some, some key questions. So I'm going to put those questions to you, if, if you don't mind. He said, if you're, if you're going to have a framework, you then have to ask who will determine its content. Will it be agreed by all members? And I suppose he means the devolved uh, governments as, as well as the UK government. Or will someone have a final decision-making power? And then he said the process of creating the frameworks would then be subject to some sort of scrutiny, whether public or parliamentary. Who will make these decisions? If decisions have been made by governments in agreement, to whom are they accountable and for, for what they do in making those agreements? So I wonder if you could, could, could give uh, us and, and Mr Rida an answer to how you view these questions and what, and what their frameworks, how they'll be arrived at. Very good questions. I think the best way of arriving at common frameworks is through a process of continual dialogue and agreement between the respective governments across the United Kingdom. We also heard from, from, from Michael Russell uh, on that, and he feels that um, we're not really getting to a stage where there is that equal partnership between the devolved governments and the UK government, and that the, um, the JMC and the JMCEN is, is not working. What would you say in, in, in reaction to that? Well, I always take anything that um, Mike Russell says seriously, um, and uh, I know that uh, Mike is committed to making sure that we can have uh, as effective a set of institutional relationships as possible across the United Kingdom. Um, in my own area, we have monthly meetings um, which bring together ministers and representatives from the devolved administrations and the UK government to address the issues which um, my department is responsible for and also related departments are responsible for. And Fergus Ewing and Rosanna Cunningham on behalf of the Scottish Government, along with Leslie Griffiths on behalf of the Welsh Government, um, have been uh, energetic and constructive um, attendees at all of those meetings. In addition to that, there is, a, there is a complicating factor, which, as we all know, is the absence of executive in, in Northern Ireland. But in their absence, we have officials from DERA, the, uh, the relevant uh, Northern Ireland government department, uh, who uh, do an excellent job in making sure that Northern Ireland's interests are represented. But of course it's the case that um, with all of the institutions that we have across the United Kingdom, we in the UK government are open to um, uh, any thoughts, suggestions or uh, recommendations from any of the constituent members of the, um, uh, the UK about how we can make these institutions work better in all our interests. So you say you're open to uh, discussion and suggestions. In a situation where a common framework is developed, um, first of all, will the, the, the governments have an equal say in how they're developed? And then when the final, the final framework of whatever whatever sector we're talking about um, is put before the, the devolved governments and all the partners, who will have the final say? If there's a disagreement in how that framework is, is, is put together by, say, the Welsh or the Scottish government where they don't agree to it, will it then have to go back and be reworked so that we can get full agreement from everyone as an equal partner? Yes, and the approach that I've taken, for example, towards some of the statutory instruments, uh, the secondary legislation that need to be put in place in order to prepare for a variety of eventualities um, with respect to exiting the EU, uh, those statutory instruments uh, have been agreed across um, uh, the United Kingdom. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank the Scottish Government and its officials um, for their, uh, their very hard work um, uh, under considerable time pressure in order to ensure that we can secure agreement on all of those areas. Well, I'm pleased to hear that, that, that each, each government um, will be able to, the whole, all governments will have to agree to a framework before it goes ahead. Um, the, the other issue that Professor Reid mentions is if a group of states or jurisdictions has agreed that there should be a common framework, 
How do we make sure they stick to it? And what happens if they do not? So I guess it's a case of who, who, well, what body is going to be put together to make sure that, say, for example, environmental protections, if one country or, or anyone that actually um, goes out with the, the parameters of that framework, you know, who, who, who watches the watchers? Well, I think in, 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 one has to look at a case-by-case -case basis, but ultimately, if something is agreed and it has legislative underpinning, uh, if it is the case that uh, uh, any administration or anyone acting in an administration's name uh, breaches those principles or breaks those laws, then there are appropriate regulators and ultimately the courts which can make sure that people comply with the law. Which, which courts would that be? It, all, it would depend specifically on which particular uh, situation we faced. For example, if it were the case that a local authority um, in England were not living up to its obligations on, on say, air quality, uh, then it would be the case, ultimately, that the courts could intervene. And moving on just br briefly about the impact of EU exit on the devolution settlement, um, we, we have uh, heard from quite a number of people that they believe that the, the devolution settlement as provided for in the Scotland Act is insufficient to accommodate uh, returning EU powers to devolve policy areas and that the JMC cannot provide an effective forum for partnership working and dispute resolution. What would your response be to that? I think one has to look at each of the specific examples. We've been uh, talking with the Scottish, Welsh, uh, Scottish and Welsh governments and also with the Northern Ireland uh, uh, Civil Service about different specific uh, challenges and opportunities that leaving the European Union provides. And so far, even though there have been differences of opinion at, uh, at different points, we've managed to find a pragmatic way forward um, in almost every area. And I think that is the, the right way to go, inevitably. When you have a family of nations and a family that works together uh, very effectively, then the best thing to do is to make sure that you give a fair hearing to all and that we um, arrive at a consensus. And so far, um, in all of the areas that I can think of, which um, uh, are critical to making sure that we, we work in the interests of all our citizens, a uh, consensus or a modus vivendi, a way of working, um, has been arrived at. So can you confirm then that the Scottish Government and indeed the Scottish Parliament, um, all the powers that are returning from the EU that relate to devolved, uh, devolved powers will all be dealt with and scrutinised by the Scottish Parliament and will be um, acted upon by the Scottish Government? Yes, one of the things about leaving the European Union is that it means that powers come back to not just the UK Parliament, but also um, to, uh, to Holyrood, to the Welsh Assembly Government and to the Northern Ireland Executive when it's reconstituted. OK, we're going to move on to questions from Mark Ruskell. Thanks, Kavina. Yeah, um, good morning. Um, I'd like to ask you about the chemicals regulations, the kind of shadow chemicals regulations that are being established at UK level. Uh, alongside REACH. Now, we've spent some time looking at this in committee, and I know that Westminster committees have also been examining them. And I think one of the concerns that's been raised is the potential for duplicate animal testing. You know, we've had 10 years of animal testing for chemicals, and now it appears that under the UK shadow regulations, there may be a requirement for retesting of chemicals that have already been proven to be safe. What's your response to that? And can you rule out duplicate animal testing? Um, I, I don't see that there would be a case for duplicate animal testing, because one of the things that we want to do is to find a, um, a UK REACH IT uh, system, which would allow people to, to transfer um, the registration of chemicals that have already been registered with REACH straight over without the need for additional testing. Um, again, I'd want to see any specific examples of where uh, uh, people have concerns, but I, 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 I can't envisage any need for uh, a repeat animal testing, no. Well, I mean, that, that, that's a, a worthy aspiration, but I mean, the reality is that there are data issues to do with the registration of chemicals, which means that the data cannot be uh, instantly transferred over to the UK regulations and be used in the same way. So, I mean, th th this, isn't, this isn't news. It's something which Westminster committees have been looking at. There's been a cross-party letter that's been sent to Therese Coffey on the back of the uh, scrutiny of Westminster committees raising these issues about data. So it's not just preparedness in terms of the database, it's about the accessibility of this data. Uh, are you prepared to, to rule out then uh, the requirement for increased data, uh, sorry, increased animal testing? 
Uh, yes, I think, I think that um, it is the case that ultimately, while the data is registered with REACH, the data belongs to the, the, the relevant chemical companies, so they can make sure that that data is provided to a, uh, a UK um, uh, database, just as they have to uh, the, uh, the REACH database already. I don't see that uh, any problem need arise. But of course, if there are specific examples, chemical by chemical or company by company, um, where individuals have raised concerns, then I and um, uh, Dr Coffey would be more than happy to look at them. Okay. Uh, another concern that's been raised with us in relation to these regulations is that it does dismantle the stakeholder expert working group uh, that has been used with the REACH regulations to really flesh out stakeholder concerns. Uh, whether that's uh, you know, input from industry or animal welfare NGOs or unions or others. Uh, we don't have that kind of system. We don't have the expert working group within the system that you're proposing. Will you reconsider that? Will you establish expert stakeholder working groups in order to explore these kind of issues that concern people? I'm always open to uh, working with industry in order to ensure that we can provide them with all the assurance they need. But... Uh, there's one other thing that I, I, I would say. Of course, we're discussing a variety of potential EU exit scenarios, but the, uh, the UK government has said that we want to remain part of REACH and we want to be an associate member of the European Chemicals Agent, uh, uh, Agency. So uh, if we achieve our negotiating objectives, and I think this is shared actually across parties, then we will still be part of the REACH system. But of course, we have to prepare for the eventuality of a no-deal exit. And in those circumstances, then we would be uh, more than happy to uh, continue and to intensify our work with industry mm -hmm. in order to make sure that um, industry is satisfied that we're doing everything we can. And, of course, that the end users of chemicals and the wider public have their particular concerns about uh, health and safety properly addressed. Mm -hmm. So you acknowledge, then, that the current EU system uh, is the best system. It works in, in the best way, and you want to remain aligned to that and, and continue to use that. Can I go back to the original question then around the stakeholder working groups? If we leave without a deal, will you seek to mirror that stakeholder working group within the UK regulations? Will you instruct the HSE, for example, to set up that working group so we can properly involve civic society and industry and others in the way that we go forward and develop our chemicals regulations in the UK? I think, I think there are two things there. On the first part, we certainly think that um, uh, for the foreseeable future, being part of the REACH regime uh, is certainly helpful. There's always a balance each way. And in respect of that balance, if we were to have a no-deal exit and we were to have um, our, our own system um, established, which we've taken um, uh, significant steps to do, um, then that would allow us to explore new and perhaps better ways of making sure that industry and other concerns were incorporated. Um, the uh, Health and Safety Executive is the direct ministerial responsibility of another colleague in the UK government, uh, but I can't imagine that they would have any problem with taking the sorts of steps that you've had there. Okay, thank you. Just a, f a follow up um, while we're, we're, we're talking about reach. Um, obviously, over the last, I guess, six months, um, we've all been working very hard in the Scottish Parliament committees to scrutinise SIs that have come that have been put in place in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Now, we, uh, we looked at them and the understanding that they were for a no-deal scenario. Um, we're now finding out that actually they are a, pretty much a, a permanent situation. Um, we want to, want to ask you if because that was a very quick process, it had to be a very quick process, we might have given um, not as much scrutiny to some of these SIs as much as we would have actually liked. And, and certainly in looking at the REACH, that was an area that we felt a little bit conflicted in actually um, agreeing to, to that SI. Will those SIs be reviewed in, in, a, um, in the light of, you know, if there is a deal or if there is not a, a Brexit um, because there are some stakeholders that are saying that there have been mistakes made. Well, again, we are perfectly happy to review any piece of legislation, primary or secondary, if uh, a case can be made for alteration. We wanted, and we're, uh, again, um, I want to emphasise how grateful I am to the Scottish Government and um, its officials. Uh, we, we did work um, under time pressure to get um, the statute book um, uh, ready for a no-deal exit. Again, there is the possibility that it could occur again on October the 31st. And indeed, even between now and October the 31st, some EU legislation uh, may change and is changing. And so therefore, we may need to update secondary legislation in the UK in order to keep pace appropriately. But of course, we'd be more than happy to take evidence 
from the Scottish Government or others um, if there is any aspect of the existing statute book that needs to be updated or reformed. Mm. And will you commit to giving the Scottish Parliament more time to actually review any SIs in the future? We had a situation where at least one SI that I can think of was actually laid in the UK Parliament before we had time to scrutinise it and we had to effectively um, rubber stamp it without any real uh, time for scrutiny. And indeed, even if our scrutiny has go had gone a different way, it wouldn't have mattered. Well, we all want to make sure that we can uh, give every part of the uh, UK um, and all our representative institutions within the UK appropriate time to uh, reflect on any legislation that we require and in particular to make sure the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly and others have uh, the time and the resource they need to provide effective scrutiny. OK, move on to questions from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, I want to just talk about a few financial things. Um, I will be with you in your next committee, because I'm also in the Rural Committee. So the, the first one I want to just talk about is that uh, the CAP uh, provides a number of uh, areas of finance of interest to this committee yeah. that relate to environmental actions, biodiversity, uh, climate change projects, tree planting. Um, so just a general high-level question about CAP. Uh, CAP uh, puts in place a seven-year programme of commitment of financial support uh, to farmers and others. Uh, but the UK government at the moment uh, has basically committed to continue the current arrangements financially until the end of this parliament. Uh, how can you deliver something that uh, is functionally equivalent to the seven-year programme that uh, farmers and others could rely on when they were in the cap, which helps them make the long-term planning they often require to make? Well, I think the first thing to say is that the overall guarantee that the UK government has given on, um, on funding uh, for um, uh, farmers, land managers and landowners is at the moment a greater degree of assurance than any other EU country has. We don't know at the moment what the future common agricultural policy regime will be post-2020, but we do know that the amount that we spend on um, uh, 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 farming support and um, rural enterprise is going to remain absolutely the same in cash terms until 2022. So at the, m at the moment of um, uh, questioning and replying, we are providing farmers across the United Kingdom with a greater degree of certainty. We're also considering um, uh, potential amendments to our agriculture bill in order to make sure that we can have a, a multi-annual financial framework in order to provide a greater degree of certainty. And in addition to that, we've also laid out a programme um, for an agricultural transition, which would mean that we would move away from our existing system of funding to a new system of funding in England, which would uh, uh, guarantee, of course, uh, that we would continue generously to support uh, rural enterprise and farming, but we would increasingly put the money towards public goods um, uh, uh, rather than simply uh, an area-based payment of the kind that the Common Agricultural Policy has had for um, uh, several years. Um, that appears to be welcome if we, we have the similar uh, view forward of, of a seven-year horizon that enables farmers and land managers generally to make the plans that they want to make. That, 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 that's helpful. Uh, I suspect in Scotland we are uh, equally of the view that area-based payments uh, have to shift to some extent to production, which perhaps might be different. That's not for today's discussion at all at the moment. Um, I want to just ask you about uh, the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, which relates to both the committees you'll be talking to today. Um, we've heard the title, a shared prosperity fund, uh, but ministers are currently telling us that they have no knowledge whatsoever of how that's to be structured. And I note uh, some of the comments you're reported to have been saying uh, over the weekend about uh, that would suggest a transfer of some of the spending decisions that are made in, in Edinburgh to, to your office in London. Would you care to comment on that? Well, I think the first thing to say is that um, in uh, December of last year, uh, we were able to announce on top of uh, the current EMF allocations um, uh, an, an extra £37 million uh, to help the UK seafood sector. So this is money that the UK government has provided, um, and that money will be split broadly along EMFF um, allocations, and it will be for the uh, appropriate um, uh, uh, governments and uh, uh, executives 
to spend that money as they see fit. So this is additional cash um, which goes to the devolved administrations, which they can spend in an appropriate way, which supplements what the EMFF does. Um, one of the things I, I think it's important to be able to do is to ensure that when we come uh, forward with proposals for a shared prosperity fund and for other means of support, that the UK government can uh, devote extra resources beyond those that the Scottish government already has in areas which are default. So, for example, it may well be that we consider it appropriate to provide additional resources to Scotland, uh, for example, to invest in uh, uh, the redevelopment of uh, Fraserburgh Harbour. Um, it would be a good thing, I think, if um, uh, your constituents and David Ugood's constituents would have the confidence of knowing that the Scottish Government and the UK Government were working together to take advantage of the opportunities that exist, that exist outside the common fisheries policy. But uh, everything that we're talking about is additional support and help for Scotland um, in order to enable Scotland's industries um, and Scotland's citizens to take advantage of the opportunities that will exist outside the European Union. Um, much of that's uh, very welcome. It's off your responsibilities and perhaps today, but if the UK government were to provide more opportunities for contracts for difference, that would certainly help Fraserburgh Harbour in their aspirations to be uh, a major offshore uh, renewable energy source. But let me just uh, move on a little bit in the limited time the community is allowing me um, to uh, another financial subject which kind of crosses the boundary again. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'm told UK ministers have constantly been saying to MPs, uh, that there will be uh, constantly giving assurances that trade will uh, continue unimpeded. Now, for local government, there is one issue there, and that is the export health certificates. Now, we understand that uh, may cost 17 to 30, the figure is imprecise, uh, million pounds for seafood and there may be other industries affected. And it's essentially local government. Now, there's a general commitment to the UK government to make sure that the devolved administrations and ourselves in Scotland are no better, no worse off uh, after departure from the EU. Is that something that's on your radar? Because the EHC is both a financial burden but an administrative burden and a potential source of delay for live animal exports in particular, and I'm thinking of lobsters, crabs, and so on. Yes, it's a, it's a very important point. I, I had the opportunity uh, just under a fortnight ago to uh, visit an exemplary uh, 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 fish processing business in Aberdeen, Nolan Seafoods, um, and while there I talked to a number of representatives from uh, the uh, fish processing sector, um, and they reflected uh, to me the um, additional uh, requirements that would be um, uh, placed on uh, ports, harbours and local government in order to make sure that export health certificates um, uh, were granted. And one of the things that I said then is um, I had said to Fergus uh, Ewing that um, uh, I would uh, be more than happy to provide additional resource in order to make sure that we have the trained inspectors required uh, uh, to uh, uh, expedite uh, the effective export of Scotland's great uh, uh, seafood produce. And this would be an example, I think, of the UK government providing additional resource both to the Scottish government itself and also potentially to local government, to Aberdeenshire Council, because we just want to make sure that uh, uh, the, those industries that will benefit from EU exit are supported every step of the way. Uh, a tiny thing, almost an observation, you probably don't have time to respond. Mm. Um, the UK Climate Change Committee has recommended that uh, Scotland be planting a very large proportion of the UK's forestry in response to climate change. Will the UK government uh, support that uh, effort because it's in UK's interest that we do well on climate change to support your efforts? Yes, one of the things which I admire is the way in which Fergus has um, uh, developed a, an, an approach towards um, uh, forestry that is uh, progressive and um, uh, market sensitive. And I want to work with Fergus and um, those involved in the forestry sector in Scotland to, to ensure that our shared ambitions can be uh, more successfully achieved. Thank you. Thank you. We move on to questions from Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Um, good morning, Secretary of State. Uh, I'm sure the uh, REC committee will take the opportunity to discuss fisheries with you in the next session uh, coming up this morning. But if I could turn to salmon populations uh, briefly, mm -hmm. which is the, uh, the remit of this committee. Um, each year, our committee scrutinises wild salmon regulations, which uh, clearly seek to protect wild salmon in Scottish waters. Now, as we all know, uh, wild salmon numbers continue to decline. 
Um, yeah. And since we last spoke with you last June, um, we've seen new regulations uh, south of the border uh, preventing netting of salmon in the northeast of England, which uh, uh, exploited salmon destined for Scottish rivers. Uh, and of course, we've taken our own uh, me measures with regard to netsmen in Scotland. So, can you tell uh, or can you update the committee uh, how these new regulations are being monitored and enforced in the North East of England? Well, we do take in incredibly seriously uh, the decline in um, uh, salmon uh, stocks in uh, in all our rivers. And um, you know, as someone who has um, uh, uh, fished on the Tweed and someone who just, um, uh, again, a few weeks ago was talking to uh, those responsible for managing the D um, when I was to Des Moines. Um, I'm aware that there are a number of factors in play here. Um, and of course, we must have um, uh, effective monitoring of uh, the netting regulations, but we also need to take into account the fact that, um, uh, as I was told on the D, um, we need to look at land use. We need to look at the way in which um, uh, we may have soil runoff, for example, uh, having an impact on uh, the environment in the Dee and in um, other salmon rivers. Uh, we also need to consider uh, the impact of uh, climate change. Uh, again, that has a direct impact on uh, North Atlantic salmon stocks. Um, and I know that the Scottish Government has been looking at the interrelationship between wild salmon and aquaculture. So I think we need to look at all of these things holistically, because... Uh, the, the decline in salmon stocks is particularly worrying, um, and it also reflects, um, uh, and it is an acute example of the broader problems that we have with the decline in the number of freshwater fish in our rivers. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, with regard to uh, NASCO and, and the regional fisheries organisations, uh, last June uh, this committee explored the issue of whether the UK would continue its membership of regional fisheries management organisations following uh, EU exit, um, or whether replacement bodies would be established. Uh, now, we're, we're unclear whether plans to join regional fisheries management organisations such as NASCO uh, are uh, further advanced. Is there uh, any update on that that you can give this committee? Yes, um, we've applied to join five regional uh, fisheries management organisations, including NASCO, um, and the EU has agreed that um, uh, our application should be looked on uh, uh, favourably, and we have every reason to believe that uh, it's in the interest not just of the UK, but the other members of these RFMOs, um, that um, our membership should be expedited. Thank you. Questions from Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Secretary of State. Uh, I'd like to um, turn our, our scrutiny to the environmental principles, environmental governance, and um, uh, the committee would like to know if you can give a guarantee that the EU guiding principles uh, in, will be enshrined in UK law, whatever the way forward that is negotiated. And if I could just um, highlight those that we focused on in, in the continuity bill. Um, the precautionary principle, polluter pays, the prevention principle, and um, environmental damage rectified at source. And uh, if I could put on the end of that, Im importantly, animal welfare and animal sentience. So I wonder if you could give that guarantee uh, uh, and reassurance today. Yes, I can. Good, that's very good, thank you. Um, and as trade negotiations and agreements are, of course, some um, reserved, uh, what do you see the Scottish Government's role and influence in these negotiations? If you could expand on, on, uh, on that, please. Yes, we, there are a number of pieces of legislation that will uh, help shape our trade policy. Um, the first is uh, the trade bill, which is in, um, in, in the House of Lords. So there's been um, an amendment there in order to ensure that the UK Parliament uh, can, and uh, parliamentarians, can provide more effective scrutiny. It's also the case that we're in discussion with opposition parties about uh, what the best means in the agriculture bill could be of providing people with reassurance that we will maintain high standards of environmental protection and animal welfare. Um, now, trade uh, negotiations are by themselves um, uh, an exercise of uh, the royal prerogative. They, uh, uh, they lead to treaties. These treaties, of course, are then translated into UK legislation. And it's part of the tradition of the, the dualist system of UK uh, law, that um, it will be the, um, uh, the United Kingdom that will be involved in these negotiations. But um, I have sought at every turn to make sure that uh, we involve um, uh, not just parliamentarians from across the United Kingdom, but also the devolved administrations in understanding what our priorities would be in any trade negotiations that we undertake. 
Right, thank you. And could you um, explain for the committee um, in some more detail, please, Secretary of State, what the process for that engagement is and how, that, how in your view, that's working? Um, the, the principal process of engagement is through the, uh, the monthly meetings that we have of the, the relevant ministers who deal with um, agriculture, fisheries and the environment across uh, the United Kingdom. But I'm more than happy to um, intensify uh, that engagement uh, if there are particular issues of concern. And also, um, those monthly meetings have sometimes been attended by ministers from other government departments, like, for example, the Treasury. And I think if it were uh, uh, the request of ministers that um, a team from the Department for International Trade were to come along in order to explain their thinking, then, of course, that is something that we would do. Um, again, the, the leaving the European Union provides us with the opportunity to have an independent trade policy, but it is also the case that, at the moment, um, um, until the Withdrawal Agreement Bill is passed, um, uh, these issues um, rest in the future. Um, and again, even if the Withdrawal Agreement Bill is passed, we'll be, um, we hope, in an um, implementation or transition period during which, while we can talk to other uh, uh, nations about our trade arrangements, we won't be signing trade deals until that implementation or transition period ends. I see. Thank you, Secretary of State. And could, could I ask you, um, uh, in relation to the Scottish Government having, as you'll be aware, a significant um, responsibility for a large proportion of environmental law um, being devolved. And I wonder if you could comment on if you have any concerns about divergence um, and uh, how you might deal with those. I think there are theoretical concerns, yes, but um, uh, in practical terms, I just wanted to say, firstly, um, that... Uh, well, we don't always agree on every issue. I'm full of admiration for the leadership that Rosanna Cunningham has shown on uh, a number of environmental questions. And I have no doubt that uh, uh, the view um, across all parties um, in the Scottish Parliament is that uh, there shouldn't be any divergence. There should be a commitment to very, very high environmental standards. Um, and when I was um, in Aberdeen recently and talking to Donald Cameron and others in the Scottish Conservatives, I was incredibly impressed by their determination and commitment to uphold the highest possible environmental standards, and that um, was, uh, was fantastic to hear. So um, uh, the, the political commitment that underpins a shared level of high ambition, I think, is shared across parties. But, of course, as well as that commitment, we want to make sure that there are institutional mechanisms that can hold us all to uh, those high standards and those high ambitions. And uh, the Scottish Government has issued a consultation on environmental principles and governance, um, and uh, I, I wouldn't want to preempt what the conclusions of that consultation would be, but I've made an, an open offer to the Scottish Government that uh, should uh, it conclude that it wants to have uh, the Office of Environmental Protection that we're setting up in England also uh, encompass um, uh, uh, Scotland's interests, then it may be possible for us to locate that office within Scotland itself as a sign of our commitment to the whole United Kingdom upholding these standards. Uh, right, thank you, Secretary of State. And in terms specifically of environmental governments, um, there have been some concerns expressed, um, uh, not, not least by NGOs, but by, by a range of others in Scotland about um, these, these um, issues about how environmental regulation and standards will be monitored, evaluated and enforced um, in Scotland and uh, indeed across the UK. Um, and the Scottish Government has uh, told our committee that it will be legislating and is, is consulting at the moment. I wonder if you could comment on that broadly and then I might have one or two follow-up questions for you. Yes, I mean, there's no criticism of the Scottish Government to say that our own plans are more advanced, that um, we've published draft clauses um, uh, for our Environment Bill that deal with principles of governance. Those draft clauses have been subject to pre-legislative scrutiny by two committees of the House of Commons, um, on, on which there are um, uh, 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 Scottish MPs. Um, so we've, we've had feedback on those. A number of points have been raised about the way in which we might improve um, the operation of the Office of Environmental Protection. We're open-minded in considering how we might respond. As I say, it is no criticism of the Scottish Government to say that they're at a later stage in this process. They haven't, uh, sorry, earlier stage rather. They haven't come to uh, 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 bring forward the same degree of detail yet that we have south of the border. Um, and I can understand why NGOs on either side of the border uh, want a greater degree of clarity. And of course, we're engaging with them in order to make sure that the recommendations that were made as part of pre-legislative scrutiny 
uh, can uh, also meet some of the concerns, legitimate concerns that they've raised. Thank you. And lastly, uh, Secretary of State, could, could you um, comment on concerns which have been expressed, which I, I also share, about the independence of any, any watchdog um, and uh, in relation to infraction and the ability to, um, to put set fines and, and penalties? Well, I think the first thing is in terms of independence. Uh, we've been clear that the body must be, it's, it, it, it's, it's an arm's length body which must be fully independent, and we wanted to make sure that the process of appointment of um, the chair is one that is subject also to um, uh, pre-approval, sorry, so, uh, yes, pre-appointment um, uh, hearings, so that uh, uh, the, the House of Commons and its members can have absolute confidence um, in the qualities and the independence of that individual, and then that individual will be appointing the chief executive and the, uh, uh, will be responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the organisation. We also want to ensure that the, uh, the body has sufficient funding to be able to discharge its functions without feeling that it's in any way constrained. Um, uh, we're bringing forward commitments in order to give further effect to that. Um, and then, uh, more broadly, in terms of fines, this is an open question and it is a legitimate area of debate. The um, uh, infraction proceedings that um, uh, can be brought where members of the European Union have had an effect um, in uh, maintaining a high level of environmental protection. I don't think anyone denies that. Um, but that is a supranational finding of national governments for their failure to uh, adhere to these rules. Um, if we had fines um, within uh, any particular uh, 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 nation or state, then the question would be, what would happen to uh, those fines? You could have a situation where, for example, my department or the MOD um, was found not to have lived up to its obligations, a fine was imposed, then that money would then go to the Treasury. So in a way, we would be shifting money between different government accounts. Now, there are others who say, actually, what you could do is you could have a system of fines whereby uh, the money that came from a particular government department, let's say, for the sake of argument, it was the MOD, could go into a particular fund for environmental improvement. Um, these are open questions, but it is also the case that um, without necessarily having fines, you can also impose compliance with these rules. So we're exploring whether or not there should be a, uh, a new system of um, uh, environmental law tribunals to not to mirror, but to emulate some of the good work that immigration and employment tribunals do by developing a, a body of expertise um, uh, in the legal profession that can ensure that we have uh, the rapid um, adherence to uh, regulations and laws that guarantee high environmental protection. And of course, ultimately, um, it can be the case that um, uh, the uh, High Court can impose on a government a requirement to change its ways, which if that government, um, whether it was the UK government or any other, refused to adhere to, would mean that the, uh, the relevant uh, minister or cabinet secretary was in breach of the law with all the consequences that would follow. Thank you very much. Short supplementary question from Mark Ruskell. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I just want to go back to your point about divergence. Um, there have been concerns raised that in Scotland there has been um, a, a sort of a reduction in the um, protection that's given to Ramsar sites, you know, the, the internationally protected mm -hmm. Ramsar sites such as Cool Links and Loch Lomond. Um, I just wonder if that's something that, that you're aware of, because there does seem to be a policy divergence now across the UK in terms of the status of the protection that's given to these sites, and if that was something that DEFRA are aware of, whether you'll be notifying the Ramsar Convention, because obviously post-Brexit, you know, international uh, frameworks and, and designations are going to become increasingly important. You're absolutely right. And in the first instance, this is um, an issue that I hope that we could resolve amicably uh, between uh, the UK government, the Scottish um, uh, government, um, and others who are concerned. Um, uh, there are one, I won't go into details, but there are one or two occasions where individual UK members of the UK Parliament from devolved nations have raised issues with me where they are concerned about environmental issues either in Wales or in Scotland. Um, and the point that I have made is that while I completely understand their concerns, I have to respect the default competences of the Welsh Assembly Government and of the Scottish Government. Um, but I have also found it to be fair that when I've raised those issues informally with Scottish Government or Welsh Assembly Government Ministers, they're only too happy to take those matters up and indeed to keep the UK Government involved. Okay. Thank you. And questions from John Scott. 
thank you. Uh, good morning, Mr. Gould. Um, I just uh, want, wanted to ask you about costs and the costs of uh, our climate change bill here in Scotland have been put at something like 13 billion, but costs vary and go higher than that significantly for the targets that we're aiming for in 2045 or 2050. Um, what percentage of these costs uh, will be borne by the UK uh, government what, and relative to the Scottish government uh, in terms of the shared objectives that we all have in terms of and delivering um, carbon reduction and keeping temperature at 1.5 degrees? We will work with the Scottish Government in order to make sure um, that we have effective burden sharing, but also that we can all benefit from the, the changes that um, uh, we can make in order to ensure that we have clean growth in the future. So I'd say a couple of things. Uh, there are sometimes initial... You know, to take uh, renewables as an example, there are sometimes initial costs and initial subsidies in making sure that we can uh, kickstart or pump prime growth in renewables. And we had subsidies, for example, for for solar power. There's been some criticism um, of the government, UK government, in removing some of those subsidies for solar power. But the reason why the subsidies went is because the price of solar dropped. There was no need for the subsidies. The industry was going well. Um, and we have had since 2010, 99% um, of uh, the solar power generated in this country being generated since then. So, of course, we will talk to um, uh, the Scottish Government. We'll seek to develop a framework whereby we can work together in order to um, advance action to deal with climate change. Um, and I hope that across the UK we can also uh, reap the benefits. There were references made earlier by, uh, by uh, Stuart to uh, some of the work that's being undertaken in Fraserburgh uh, to think about um, uh, the, uh, the, the possibilities of um, the North East of Scotland using its expertise in the energy sector to play a bigger role in uh, carbon capture and storage and in other um, uh, uh, of the uh, initiatives that we need in order to deal effectively with climate change. So we are open to discussions with the Scottish Government, the Scottish Civil Society and the Scottish uh, entrepreneurs in order to ensure that we can help them um, in the fight against climate change and also in the effort to ensure that technologies that we develop to deal with climate change can also contribute to jobs and growth in Scotland as well. Um. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you more specifically about carbon capture, about support for agriculture, support for transport and infrastructure, HS2? Yeah. Where are all these costs? How are all these costs going to be met, and by whom? Well, the, the, the cost of HS2, which, um, uh, uh, if it goes ahead um, as envisaged, will bring benefits to um, the whole of the United Kingdom potentially. Um, the, the majority of those, the overwhelming majority, will be met by the UK government because, of course, we will be um, uh, developing and building that infrastructure. But if we think about um, uh, other aspects of carbon capture and storage, for example, um, uh, the, the restoration of peatland to um, uh, uh, the best possible environmental condition, or indeed tree planting, um, one of the things that we want to do is to work with the Scottish government in order to make sure that we respect its devolved competence, but we also recognise that if Scotland is, as it has in the past, um, punched above its weight in some of these areas, that we can do everything that we can to support. Because I think um, uh, the, uh, the working together of the Scottish and the UK governments in the battle against climate change shows how we, as a United Kingdom, can collectively punch above our weight. Um, I, I, I won't take anything away from the determination and energy of uh, uh, members of the Scottish Parliament across parties to deal with this issue. But I think we all recognise that it's effective working across all the nations of the United Kingdom that can mean not just that we have additional economic benefits because we can invest in technology more effectively, it also means that we have additional environmental benefits because we can work together across these islands. Um, and it seems to me that um, the more one thinks about both the, uh, the challenges and the opportunities of environmental improvement and change, the more one realises that the United Kingdom is a powerful platform on which we can all stand. Thank you. Okay. Um, Stuart Stevenson has a short question. Um, I just wanted to go back to the appointments to uh, the oversight body. The UK Climate Change Committee and appointments to that and the appointment of the chairman requires the unanimous agreement of all four jurisdictions. Is that the model you're looking for um, in this body? And I encourage you to say yes, because I think that would 
absolutely guarantee that it's independent of the transitory views and decisions of any single administration and thus have increased credibility. Um, the Climate Change Committee has done a fantastic job. Um, it's a very good model to follow. Um, and um, I will reflect on that very helpful suggestion and discuss it with Fergus because I wouldn't want to, and Rosanna because I wouldn't want to say anything that they might regard as me um, uh, boxing them in. Very wise, if I may say so. Okay, coming back to climate change and the, climate cha the Committee for Climate Change report, Mark Ruskell has some questions in that area. Um, I do, yes. Um, you, you've met Greta Thunberg, you've read the UK Climate Change Committee uh, recommendations, you'll have heard the response to those recommendations from the Scottish Government uh, announcing a net zero by 2045 target if you, the UK state, adopt a net zero by 2050 target. So have you got good news for us in this committee this morning? I'm afraid I can't make that announcement uh, uh, now and today. Oh. One of the things about... <laughs> Thank you. One of the things about uh, the UK government structure is, again, um, in the same way as the Scottish government has um, overlapping responsibilities, um, but also a division of responsibilities between Fergus Ewing and Rosanna uh, Cunningham. So there are overlapping, but also uh, um, uh, separate responsibilities between my department and Greg Clark's department, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And Greg's is the lead department um, when it comes to uh, responding to the recommendations of the Climate Change Committee. As I mentioned in response to Stuart's question earlier, I've got the highest regard for John Deben and the work of the CCC. Um, uh, the report makes a number of very, very powerful arguments, mm -hmm. um, which I welcome. But the official government response um, will, will have to come um, just a wee bit later and from Greg. Um, but I hope that you can take from my comments my uh, gratitude for the, the CCC's work, um, my appreciation of the urgent need for us all to do more, and also my acknowledgement that the Scottish Government is, uh, uh, and indeed Scottish parliamentarians from every party, are, are, are making the case for more urgent action as well, which I welcome. Well, it, it certainly is urgent, and I think the question is not just about setting the target and when you're able to do that, it's also about what actions you're going to take, what changes you're going to make to government policy as a result, you'll have heard also the First Minister announce here in Scotland that there's going to be a full review of every single Scottish Government policy. Obviously, I'm, I'm very mm. much looking forward to that as a Green. Um, will the UK Government be doing something similar? I mean, you, you pointed to the fact that you represent mm. one department, there are other departments that mm. cut across climate change. Isn't that where the real action needs to take place? There needs to be a full review of all government policy and what, what policies would you like to see reviewed in that mix? Well, I think there are a whole range. Um, I think everything from um, how we uh, build our homes and where we build them, uh, to land use, uh, to uh, the whole question of um, uh, not just energy generation itself, but also um, how we decarbonise particularly energy intensive parts of the economy. Uh, for example, um, steel and uh, concrete production. Um, I think that we also need to look um, at uh, uh, how we design our transport system. Um, and I also think that we, we need to look in particular at how we uh, get more investment in, uh, in science and innovation. Um, I think that it is an issue for, for every government department from, uh, in, the, in the UK government, from the Department for Education to the Department of Health and Social Care, the Department of Transport and the Treasury. So I don't think there is any part of government that isn't affected by uh, the, uh, the challenge of climate change and the need to respond. Do you think it should be any areas that are off limits? I mean, you know, last time we spoke, uh, we talked about the decision to uh, potentially approve a, a third uh, runway at Heathrow. Should that mm -hmm. be reviewed? Um, should your target to phase out petrol and diesel cars by 2040 be reviewed? What about those two areas? Um, on the first, um, I, I, I think it's the case that um, the Scottish Government, like the UK Government, uh, recognises the need to um, uh, look at aviation capacity in the southeast of England, and uh, the proposal to develop a new runway at Heathrow is being carried forward by uh, Heathrow and by the Bank for Transport in a way which is sensitive not just to climate change but also to air quality criteria. I thought John Holland, the chief executive of Heathrow, who sits on a, a committee in my department that looks at how we can make business more sustainable overall. Um, you know, there, are, there are 
there are lots of um, uh, opinions about what the future of aviation might involve, but I think that most people recognise that it will continue to be an important mode of transport in the future. Um, and there are perhaps technological advances um, coming down the track which can significantly reduce the environmental impact of aviation. Um, on uh, uh, the question of uh, petrol and diesel cars, um, we were one of the first countries to say that we wanted to phase out internal combustion engine sales by 2040. Uh, there are a lot of other countries that have more ambitious targets than that. My view is that um, all, all of these targets need to be kept under review. We shouldn't have arbitrary dropping and changing, but what we should do, and this I think has been the approach of the Climate Change Committee as well, is if you set a, uh, a, a, an ambitious but achievable target, and then people are on course to meet that, then you can make the target a wee bit more ambitious um, uh, thereafter. So I'm not yeah. signalling that we'll change it, but I am saying that it is not something that um, uh, we regard as uh, uh, the, um, the very limit of our ambition. If it is the case that we are making progress and we, and, and we can secure uh, consent for a higher level of ambition, then that's something that we, and I don't think any other government, would keep under review. So who's, who's going to be first then? Is it, is it the European... Sorry. I have to bring in Finn Carson. There are other people who want to okay. ask questions on this theme. Okay. I apologise. Finn Carson. Morning, Secretary of State. Um, we, we all understand that low-carbon far, uh, farming practices, afforestation, agroforestry and peat uh, and restoration are all crucial to uh, reducing emissions. Uh, and you'll be pleased to hear that the, the majority of the discussions taking place in Scotland around that are based on ideas that you've floated in the past and probably in light of a vacuum of ideas coming from the Scottish Government at the moment. Can you give us some more ideas on the policies which uh, may encourage emission reduction? And do you believe that we need to move beyond the, the current voluntary uh, approach? so we can get the connection back. There we are. Mr Gove, can you hear us? We lost you for a second. I'll, 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 I'll just, I was just hearing the beginning of Finlay's question and then it cut right. out. OK, I'll go back to Finn Carson and they can uh, recap. Thank you. I'll, I'll try again. We, we know how important low-carbon far, uh, farming, forestation, agroforestry and peat uh, land restoration will be in tackling uh, uh, climate change. Uh, I was saying you'd be pleased to hear that the, the vast majority of discussions taking place among stakeholders in Scotland are based on the ideas you've floated uh, previously. Uh, and also there, there's a lack of uh, ideas coming forward from the Scottish Government. So I, I'm looking for your position on uh, policies that might uh, encourage emission reduction in agriculture and whether we potentially need to move beyond the, the current voluntary approach. <laughs> Um, uh, I think that, well, thank you for what you say, and I'm also very grateful to the, uh, the NFU, whose leader, uh, Minette Batters, has said that she wants to move to zero emissions in agriculture by 2040. Um, and I think the leadership that she has shown has been exemplary. And you're absolutely right. If you think about things like agroforestry, uh, the common agricultural policy works against that. Um, uh, as you know, um, uh, trees on farmland are deemed permanently ineligible features for subsidy or support under the Common Agricultural Policy. The approach that we want to take it will be more flexible and will allow people to combine um, enlightened environmental measures, which uh, provide not just habitat for wildlife, but also um, a, a carbon sink um, alongside uh, effective food production. Uh, one of the other things that we also recognise is that um, improved animal health can ensure that greenhouse gas emissions are reduced and also improved management of manures and flurries can also help in that way. There are a number of different things that we can do where the government, we think, can support farmers to do the sorts of things that farmers want to do by providing support for capital investment um, and also by providing recurring income support for doing the right thing. Now, I hope that the Scottish Government will move in that direction. Um, I was very struck when I was in Aberdeen, uh, as I say, just under a fortnight ago, that one of the uh, NFU Scotland uh, 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 senior officials there um, was critical of the Scottish Government for not having come forward with a comparable vision for the future of Scottish agriculture. Um, and I do think that there is an opportunity, um, which I'm sure 
uh, yourself and others in the social department will take up in order to try to shape the future direction of agricultural policy so that high quality Scottish, Scottish produce continues to enjoy um, a, a, a strong export performance, but also that Scottish agriculture can play its uh, a distinguished part in dealing with environmental questions as well. Could I, I ask for um, your thoughts on the interim targets in view of the IPCC report um, uh, and, and the recommendation to hold us below um, 1.5 um, and rapid transformational change? Could, could, you, um, expl could you share those thoughts with us, please? Yes, on a as I say, one of the things that um, uh, is a feature of the UK government is that um, Greg Clark and um, Michael Claire Perry are the lead ministers in this area. But I do believe that a higher level of ambition is required. And one of the things that I've asked my department to do is to consider what we can do in order to make our direct contribution. And my department leads on um, adaptation to climate change, which is why you will have heard from colleagues in the environment agency who are responsible for, uh, for example, flood management south of the border, some of the steps that they believe that we need to take in order to deal with um, the effects of climate change. But it's also the case that there are areas, as, um, as Finley was pointing out, which my department is responsible for south of the border that can contribute to climate change uh, mitigation. Um, and uh, whether it comes uh, to uh, questions like land use um, or even the, uh, the principle of uh, biodiversity net gain for new developments, um, which is a good in itself, but which can also ensure that we have the types of habitats that can uh, help us in the battle against climate change. We are anxiously looking to see what we uh, can do more in order to play our shared part in this endeavour. Mr Gove, that in order for Scotland to reach the very challenging targets that they've been advised by the CCC, a lot has to happen at UK level as well, particularly around things like the decarbonisation of the, the gas network, investment in carbon capture and storage, and, and, and regulation around, around uh, energy supply. Yes, I think that we do need to work together. And again, it comes back to one of the points um, that was touched on earlier. Um, uh, my view is that um, this is a... Uh, a shared responsibility um, across the whole of the United Kingdom um, and I admire what Scottish parliamentarians have done to ensure that uh, this issue is properly addressed and to put it higher up the agenda um, but I also want to make sure that the UK government's um, uh, resources uh, can be deployed in, uh, in every way possible uh, in order to help uh, the Scottish government and Scottish entrepreneurs and Scottish civil society to do more. My, my view is that when it comes to uh, helping Scottish universities to play their part, and helping Scottish enterprises to play its part, then what we need to do is to, is to work together as pragmatically and energetically as possible. Okay, and a final question from John Scott. Um, thank you again, uh, convener. And declaring an interest as a farmer, I just want to take you back to um, Finlay Carson's question again and, and reinforce that, that agriculture is regarded as one of the sectors that needs to do more, yet while aviation, for example, is able to offset their carbon emissions by planting trees elsewhere in the world, uh, farmers and landowners do not get credit for planting trees or allowing wind farms on their land or, or peak wetting. Uh, do you think a more holistic approach to agriculture um, is required rather than the way carbon production and mitigation is measured by the IPCC. And uh, obviously, it may be not fair to ask you that in Scotland, but uh, gener in the generality, do you think a parallel approach to actually measuring the contribution that agriculture makes is required? Yes, I do. Um, and I think it's also one of the things that we're seeking to do south of the border is to make sure but farmers who do do those things, and many of them uh, do them energetically and without appropriate reward, are rewarded from the public purse for contributing to uh, the wider public good of dealing with environmental damage. Um, and one of the things that I hope that we can do is work with the Scottish Government to ensure that the sorts of approaches that we're pioneering south of the border can be adopted in Scotland. Obviously, it's a matter of resolved competence. Obviously, Scotland's geography. Thanks very much. Thank you. 
Um, we appear to have lost Mr Gove again, but I just want to thank him for the evidence that he's given us this morning. And that concludes the committee's business in public today. At our next meeting on the 21st of May, we'll be taking further evidence on the climate change emissions reductions targets. Scotland Bill at Stage 2 from the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform. And as agreed, we'll now move into private session and ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of this meeting is now closed. <laughs>